This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. Now, in doing this book, but you're, you're embarking, or you're, you're actually deeply engaged in the Richard Pryor book, yeah. uh, and you're doing a great deal of research. Uh, when people think of research, a lot of times they think of hanging out in the library. Yeah. And you're doing more than that. Do you, you want to describe yeah. some of the kinds of research that you're doing? And well, it's pretty wild. How to do it? It's pretty wild. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the good thing about the Richard Pryor project right now is that uh, on a, well, one, you, you don't have a really um, intense biography yet written. So the field is open. Um, there's an enormous amount of recordings. Uh, you know, Richard Pryor wasn't happy about this, but uh, there was um, kind of bootlegs that came out. So there's a lot of kind of unauthorized recordings of him. So that, that, that actually his performances have been well recorded. You know. But uh, a lot, something that's been wonderful to me about this project is that it puts me into the world. Uh, because you know, Richard Pryor was born in 1940, so he would have been sort of 71 now. And the, the people who were with him, you know, in the kind of through his childhood and on, would be anywhere between 60. Uh, I've interviewed people who, you know, as young as, tend to be at, at least 60, and I've interviewed people who are, you know, 90 and over. And I've got to get to these people before they vanish from the face of the earth. And uh, I, I just met some wonderful, I'll just give you one story. This is a, about the, the person I met who was Richard Pryor's first manager in New York City in Greenwich, kind of came into Greenwich Village and stumbled into the Cafe Wa, which was um, the place where Bob Dylan got his start. And one of the first places to serve um, uh, cappuccino and the like, you know, in the village back in the day. Good cappuccino, the owner told me. And uh, you know, he was mentored by this guy named Manny Roth, who was actually the person who ran the Cafe Wa and had been inspired by the example of Bill Cosby. Uh, he had friends who were managing Bill Cosby, and it was a big breakout performance. Like, well, I'll manage Richard Pryor, Richie Pryor, as he called him. He's wonderful. And this guy is incredible. You know, he's 90 years old, and he asked me to meet him at 10 o'clock at night on a Saturday night, right? so it's like, and then he drove himself. Uh, you know, Starbucks was closed. He wanted me to the Starbucks. He didn't look at, notice that it was actually closed. So uh, we sat there from you know, 10 p.m. till you know 1:30 in the morning, talking about what it was like uh, for him. You know, he grew up in a very uh, poor family, dirt poor family in Indiana, southern Indiana, not far from Ku Klux Klan territory. Uh, which is one of the reasons why he is a, a Jewish person uh, bonded with Richard Pryor, given his struggles. And we talked about everything from you know, the family life to why he got interested in theater, why he founded the Cafe Well, what Greenwich Village was like in that time, and then talked about the, the kind of the time he had with Richard as um, his kind of, in some ways, a surrogate father figure. And uh, I just feel so fortunate that I have the license to track down these people. They're not always easy to find. Uh, to track them down and to get, you know, 30 minutes, two hours, sometimes as much as, you know, 10 hours of uh, even more of people's time to kind of really parse their life in great detail. And um, in, in a weird way, you um, find yourself, you know, uh, <coughs> dissecting their life uh, with uh, greater attention and scrutiny than probably anybody may have asked them to do, unless they're in psychoanalysis. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, do you sit there with a little pad, or did you have a, a recorder, or do you just remember and write it down afterwards? How, how do you no, know about the No, it's all recorded. So you know, you, uh, okay. you know I, I drop a very long list of questions. I actually believe that like the secret to a, a decent interview, um, from what I know, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but I, I feel like uh, good research is the key, you know? And so I want to know, before I go into the interview, I want to know as much as is humanly possible about this person uh, in, in ways that will affect the interview. Um, because you just, um, 
you know, they don't know what they know. You know, again, if I, if I ask, you know, somebody in the audience, say, well, what do you know about, I don't know, you know that's somebody you care for, um, probably a little spiel will pop up that maybe you've said before. But if you have mementos from that time, then you can ask very specific questions and new memories will be jarred loose. And, and also you can check their memories against the historical record, which is very important because people tell a lot of stories, but I, I want my biography to actually be uh, you know, grounded in historical fact as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's always a delicate dance because sometimes actually people are attached to stories that don't seem utterly historically impossible. Um, but you know, maybe sometimes uh, there's, there's emotional truth in the story. Sometimes actually the historical record is kind of messed up. So you have to let them go uh, with what, they're, what they think and you know, challenge them when you think you have other points of view. But it's that kind of clash of points of view that makes for great stories as well. Mm -hmm.